And it looks like we're stabilizing there. So, all right. So we'll go ahead and start. We've got a lot to cover. So as you can see, we thought we would talk about primary hypospadias repair, but really an emphasis on how do you get the best results the first time? Because obviously, once a complication occurs, the opportunity to have more difficulties with that patient increases significantly. So we'll begin with that idea. And Dr. Bush has her master's degree, and one of the things that she always tells everyone is you have to define what your outcome is. So when we say get it right the first time, well, what is right? And what we mean is a straight penis that has a meatus that's at the tip of the glands where it's supposed to be with no ur urinary channel complications. And the scar should be hidden in the natural line. So the circumcision line or foreskin reconstruction, depending on what you're dealing with. And then the natural line that guys have along the median raffe. And this is going to be the same outcome for both distal and proximal hypospadias. So we can summarize that in saying that every child you see with hypospadias has abnormal anatomy and we're going to make it into normal anatomy. And here's how we do it. So this is our algorithm and basically what you'll see is that we do two urethroplasties but our decision making is not based on meatal location but based on ventral curvature. A minimal degree of curvature, less than 30 degrees, we'll do a tip repair. If it's more than 30 degrees, we do a stag repair, and we'll explain all of this. But because ventral curvature is the driving factor, we're going to begin with that by saying, again, we are going to do the urethroplasty by tubularizing the urethral plate or a neoplate we make from graft, but we're going to decide what we do based on ventral curvature. And here's some examples of why that's important. These are a couple of great cases. So here's a patient with a classic subcoronal small meatus that looks for all the world like a distal hypospadias repair. But here's what we found intraoperatively is significant ventral curvature. And if you fix this child with a tip, you're going down a very bad pathway. On the other hand, so that was a patient that we'd fix with a stag. But on the other hand, here's a patient that looks more severe. The opening is right at the scrotum. Artificial erection, we find that this particular is straight. And so we would fix them with a the tip repair. That would be different if that same patient with a meatus located near the like scrotum this. had curvature like that, then we'd be pushing ourselves over to a stag repair. So the meatus just doesn't matter nearly as much as what we do with the curvature. So if 30 degrees is our deciding point, here's a patient that has 30 degrees. And take a moment to look at that because, and ask yourself if you're the, the surgeon making the decision, what would you do to straighten that? Because as the slide says, it just doesn't look like much curvature. And since y'all can't talk to us, we'll, I'll just answer for you and say, I suspect that all of you would look at this and say, well, we would fix that with a dorsal plication. So here's where we really learned the most that we've learned about hypospadias is with this little instrument because we were clearly underestimating the curvature. most we've learned about hypospadias i think so okay i mean it's totally changed our world to think about hypospadias in terms of curvature well for sure and and the most important thing is just think about our lives our eyes do not accurately measure things and that's why we have rulers and all other sorts of instruments to help us. And yet, all of us go in the operating room to fix hypospadias, and we know that many of those boys have curvature, and very, very few surgeons try to measure it. Some use a protractor. Dr. Bush happened to come across this instrument, which is an orthopedic instrument used to measure finger angles. And so, this can also be used, this is how we do it. And when you apply that to this, 
this be, the, the axis actually looks like that. Now, when you put that axis up there, that looks like more bending than what your eyes just said. So we're making this point to you that you need to measure curvature. We're not gonna be able to compare notes with each other about how you straightened, how we straightened, right. if we're not talking about the same you thing. You can choose a different cutoff, for instance, but unless people are measuring, we can't talk about our results in the same way. So now let's ask another question. Why is the penis bent? And again, if we could hear you and you could say something, I suspect all of you would say, well, there's core D. And so what is core D? And this slide shows the classical depiction of it, of fibrous bands, which are on the surface of the corpora, on the outside of the tunica albigenia, and it's constricting it so that with the attempt to have an erection, the ventral aspect can't stretch. And obviously, if that's what's causing curvature, then the correction of it is to cut that away, core D excision. This is a very old concept going back to the beginning of hypospadias surgery. These are drawings from how Duplé did that straightening. And as you see, he removed this, quote, fibrous tissue that was under the skin on the ventral aspect of the penis until those corpora were cleaned off. The problem with that is it doesn't always work. And that's been noticed for quite some time. Let's just take a look at some comments made by surgeons going back many decades who all found the same thing, that many patients who have failures of surgery are found to additionally have persistent or recurrent curvature. And we just published that. If you didn't see the article, you might want to look this up. So our practice, what we'll say this more in a moment, our practice is half reoperations. And we looked at those patients and we looked at those who had core D excision and 83% of them had persistent curvature that was greater than or equal to 30 degrees, 83%. That doesn't seem like that works. No, and these weren't boys who were presenting for curvature. They were boys presenting with other problems, which we'll also talk about. So what else have we been taught? Well, well again, we were taught this idea of resecting core D and the penis would be straight when all of that was removed. And, and I suspect that some of you have been taught that or have heard your mentors say that. The problem is that artificial erection to check the erection didn't come along until, as you see, in the early 1970s. And then when that happened, it became apparent that when you cut all that tissue away, it seems like the penis is straight. But if you do an artificial erection, the penis is very frequently still bent. This picture, which is our picture, mimics exactly a picture that John Duckett published a number of years ago. And he looked at that and said, well, the problem isn't core D. It's not the urethral plate tethering this side. That's what we now call the urethral plate. It's not that. It's that the ventral corpora is shorter than the dorsal corpora. And he used this term corporal disproportion. It's an, actually a term that predates him. You have heard this term before. And then the question is, well, what do you do about it? Well, Duckett said, why do we even cut away the urethral plate? If it's still bent, let's save it and let's straighten that penis with dorsal plications. Ivor Bracca, the plastic surgeon, came along and said, no, you should cut away that urethral plate but then you should still straighten any curvature that's left using a dorsal plication. So the answer to the question, how do you correct curvature after you've degloved, basically, is do an artificial erection. And then you can do a dorsal plication because in most of your proximal hypospadias patients, yeah. you're still going to see the curvature that's there. So why do we like dorsal plications? Well, they're very easy to do. And when you're in the operating room, they work. So almost all of us have been in the circumstance where we do an erection, see curvature, we put a stitch or more than one stitch and we see the penis is straight and we declare it a success. But here's the problem. We looked at that group of patients. We told you with core D excision that 83% of them had persistent or recurrent curvature. 70% of 
that had dorsal plication had persistent or recurrent curvature. And it didn't matter of those various ways that you could do it or which suit you use, it didn't matter. They all had re persistent or recurrent curvature. Usually with the suture right there. Yeah, in you the can still see spot. it. So why doesn't that work? And we all know when it comes to hypospadias repair that it's about tension. Look at this penis and look at the tension that you can see along that ventral surface right where that curvature is located. And I would urge you the next time that you're doing one of these and either you or your mentor are doing the artificial erection, take some pickups, some, opposite, some, some forceps. Some, like, take some adsense. Yeah, you pickups. can't even use your 0.5s. Yeah. You have to grab adsense and put them on the backside at the 12 o'clock position and try to pull that penis straight, a penis that looks just like this. Just try with your hands to pull it straight and then feel the force that it takes. And it's no wonder that that poor stitch isn't gonna make it having erections all day, every day, you know, like some guys do. And it's just something that's going to fail over time. So what's interesting is remember, John Duckett was one of the main proponents which influenced all of us, including probably your mentors, to rely upon dorsal plication. But they must be harvesting what he sowed all those years ago there because Doug Canning, the chief at CHOP now, wrote that they no longer do plications for over 15 degrees of curvature for this very reason. It doesn't work. It, I think it works for more than 15 degrees. But still, it does not work when you get up to 30 degrees or more curvature because the force is just too high. So when the center that promoted it no longer does it, then there should be a lesson to everybody to start re-examining how they're straight in the penis. And so the question is, well, what should you do? What should you do, Dr. Bush? Well, I think that's pretty straightforward. We're going to make an incision right through that area of bending that you see right there and about four millimeters above and about four millimeters below. So those are the lines that you see marked. And we're going to do three corporotomies. When we talk about corporotomies, we used to use the term fairy cut. and We don't use that term anymore because we think it's really misleading. It, it implies that it's a nice little tiny delicate thing and it clearly isn't. It's all the way through the tunic albuginea down to the corporal tissue. And so usually those three incisions are about eight or 10 millimeters apart if you stick a ruler on them. So you're talking about the total length. The total length from the top incision to the bottom incision and this you can system. see how much more distance that there is once we've been sized through them. So now we have lengthened the short side instead of shortening the long side and that removes all of the tension along that ventral surface of the penis. So people always look at that and their very first question is boy that looks like that's going to bleed a lot but it doesn't. And the reason is, first off, we do those incisions with a tourniquet on. And then when we're done doing that, we, we squirt topical epinephrine full strength onto that. And then we just hold some pressure. But then the, the next thing we do is we bring the urethra back out. We dissected the urethra and the urethral plate out of the way. Here's the three incisions. And then we sew the urethral meatus distal to the most distal incision. And then after that, this is a different patient, we take the dartos tissues that, and spongiosum, and spongiosum that, that are along the urethra and we stitch that outside that perimeter with some PDS suture to wall that Just off. Just kind of quilt it down. So we're not trying to, to quilt put anything it to the isthmus. in the... Yeah, not in the right, incision. Just around it. And that works great for hemostasis. And then the next question is, well, what happens with that? So this is a patient that had that done. And here we are several months later, this patient is undergoing a stack type procedure. And so he doesn't have a urethra graft yet. And you can see the little indentions where we made the incisions, but there's no bulging, there's no scarring. The penis is obviously straight. And all of that has just filled in with his own tunic albuginea. So we've published this on a couple of occasions that this technique 
works in almost every patient. And we know that in part because it, when we do a, a stage procedure, each stage we repeat the artificial erection and if the patient gets a fistula or a glans dehiscence and we're operating for that, we check an artificial erection on every those patients. We check an artificial erection. So again, a point to put in the back of your mind because we suspect that many of you are not seeing that when you go in for what seems to be a routine fistula repair, for example. We also, our practice is only hypospadias. We don't do anything else. And we see teens and adults and we do the same thing to them. So we've done this exact procedure on that population and none of them have reported erectile dysfunction. And I started doing that over 20 years ago. So this process works, but maybe you're wondering, well, but why can't we just do one corporotomy right. instead? It seem easier. The problem is we see recurrent curvature even with a, vent a single ventral corporotomy. And I think we're really asking, especially for the higher degrees of curvature, too much of that one little incision. Instead of spacing it out over three incisions where the body can feel that in, you're putting all of your eggs in this basket with that one incision. So usually people make it wider, almost unhinging of the penis. And then when they do that, they place a graft. So now we've got the problem with putting a graft. One incision may not be enough to really elongate it. All grafts have some degree of contracture, usually around five or 7%. So you're gonna have some failures just because of graft contracture. And then you're not putting, I mean, you're, it's something foreign. It's not tunica albuginea. So you could potentially have diverticula or stretching of this material. And finally, if you place a graft into the corpora, you can't place a urethral graft on top of that because you don't want to put a graft on top of the graft. You're not going to have a good outcome from that. But here's the main point. This is better than plication or cordy excision, but one third of patients have a recurrent curvature when we have less than 2%. One corporotomy is not the best answer to the question. And let's go back. We started this whole discussion by asking you why the penis is bent, and you responded to me that it was due to core D. And we're going to tell you, just get rid of that term from your head. You shouldn't use it at all, because the penis is bent for three reasons. Short skin, short urethral plate, and short corpora. And you want to go in that order when you're assessing somebody with curvature. Of course, because you begin the operation by releasing the skin. And so if it's still bent after you've done that, well, the skin is short, you know that, but that's not the reason for bending in this patient. And then if you follow our algorithm, you're going to transect the urethral plate. And sometimes the penis becomes straight, but usually it doesn't because this is the reason that most patients have curvature of the penis more than 30 degrees. For those of you who joined us late, that's our cut point for over 30 degrees, they're going to get a stage repair, under 30 degrees, they're going to get a tip repair. So we're talking about why do penis, why are penises bent 30 degrees or more? And most of them are due to that, not due to core D. And the point, the, we we're talking about hypospadias, and so far all we're talking about is curvature, and that's because your operation is not successful if the penis isn't straight, in part because these boys grow up into be men, and we have a huge practice. We did another one today of taking boys that, that now are grown up, the penis is bent because they had cordy excision or a dorsal plication. Mm -hmm.
Hello, can you hear us? We're back. Sorry, we had technical difficulties. Sure, sure. We can hear you. You're good. Great. Wow, just all of a sudden we were gone. We were still talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's there let's go. go. Oh my gosh. Sorry. So this is what we were talking about, how the penis, this is where we cut out that the penis has to be straight. And the last point we were making is that patients you see with urethroplasty complications, it has to be in your mind that they have ventral curvature. Again, these patients did not come to us because of ventral curvature. They came to us before for the usual things that you're used to, fistulas, dehiscent strictures and all, and yet we found, as we've said, 85% of them had curvature more than 30 degrees, and here is just a potpourri of those problems. So you have to look for that. Can you diagnose that preoperatively? And this is a very classic appearance. So if you're seeing this in proximal hypospadias patients, there should just be these alarm bells going off that that penis is still bent. It has that weird kind of triangular shape to it. And most importantly, when you try to lift up on the penis, it springs back down. So if you can think of, you know, guys with a penis that don't have hypospadias, you can put the penis up towards their belly button or to the right or to the left, and it stays there. But these will spring back down no matter what the age is because it. there's tension on things. So the answer is yes, but again, this is something I wasn't taught to do, and I'm just going to guess that you probably haven't been taught to do that, and that's why we're taking time to emphasize it, because again, everything that we do depends on that curvature. So now we're going to finally get to talk about urethroplasty, and so we'll start by talking when there's no curvature or curvature less than 30 degrees, because that we will correct with a dorsal plication. So when it's less than 30 degrees, we're going to do a tip repair. You can find all of these details on our YouTube channel. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time here because so many of these steps are important, but it's just impossible to go over yeah. everything with you. So, and, and for distal tip, the um, key steps of the procedure have not changed from the original description. So you can look for that, but remember that if the penis is straight or has less than 30 degrees, regardless of where the meatus is, we're going to do a tip. So occasionally we still do a proximal tip and we'll just emphasize here what's different about it. Well, in this case, we're going to do an interrupted initial layer and a running second layer, not the other way around, because it's important to get good alignment and good sealing of the neo-urethra. And you're gonna see that again when we talk about stage repairs, because we do it exactly the same way. Instead of using dartos, in all proximal hypospadias, we use tunica vaginalis. But of all of this, when we talk about tip, the single most important thing that you need to remember is that incision needs to be deep as it shows right there. When I was a trainee, learning with him, and he would occasionally let me use the scissors to cut that, it was always deeper. He would take the scissors and cut it down even further. It should go all the way to the corpora so that it's really shiny corpora that you're on top of. Any sort of web tissue that's part of that urethral plate needs to go away. It's so crucial. So these are our published results, and this was consecutive distal hypospadia. It's not patients that we selected from a larger group to do tip repair. So since I published tip repair, I haven't done a different distal hypospadias repair. And you see we had very low complications. And those of you who may have been taught to worry about this stenosing, what well, we don't see it. And when we do see it from others, we know it's almost always a technical, technical error. error. And the other thing, in case some of you are, are being taught about grafting the tip incision, we, we don't think it's wrong to do it, but we never do it. And we have these kinds of results. And these results are not unique to us. This is a meta-analysis. You see a lot of patients evaluated and they have the same overall complication rate and the same low incidence of the various typical complications that occur, including a very low incidence of obstruction. The problem is though that not everybody gets that right. 
This is a Dutch study, uh, which was done connecting their various centers together and using a standardized data form that Dr. Bush helped them organize. And what you see is that most of their surgeons did not achieve those results. Most of them were up here. And most of these repairs were distal primary tip repairs. So why is that? What's the difference? So a few years ago at a meeting, Andy Kirsch came up to me and he, he was standing there looking around. He said, well, if we've got 30 pediatric urologists here, we've got 30 different ways to do a tip repair. And I think he's right, as you'll see in a moment, but, but there's not 30 ways that you can do those key steps and get the results that we've just showed. And we know that, we already said that our half our practice is re-operations and we get those operative notes. So we'll take one second, let you look at that. These are things that we've read in operative notes, technical errors. These are all mistakes that so surgeons have done. Fellowship training programs in many places in the country. And, and so, and these all directly relate to the complications that the patient came to us with. So if you see something that your mentors are doing on this list, you need to put that in your head that it's not potentially a technical do. error that you don't want to replicate. So are there, are there reasons you shouldn't do a tip repair? And perhaps you've been told this, that if you have a narrow urethral plate, that that's a contraindication. Well, we've published a good series. You can look at that showing that that is not the case or the plate is flat or unhealthy, et cetera. Again, we've published several times that and that is not the published. case. Yeah, others have too. Because as I said, I haven't done anything else during all of this time. So obviously these factors don't make a difference. So we thought it'd be fun just to put just a, a random group of pictures of boys with distal hypospadias and have you just ponder for a minute. There's 40 of you watching this. If each of you could grade this, good for tip, bad for tip, good for tip, bad for tip, whatever, do you think you would agree? And the fact, sir, is that study's also been done too. Uh, up in Toronto, they did a study and they did this exact thing. They took pictures like that and they showed it to pediatric garage, said it's good for tip, bad for tip, and look at what they <laughs> what found. What they showed is that they can't agree on anything. Nothing. So this is important because you don't need, we, we would do a tip, we did a tip on every single one of these patients. You don't need to worry yourself about that. If the penis is straight, you can do a tip repair. As long as you do steps correctly. In the correct way. So the problem isn't the anatomy, it's the surgeon. So let's just look, here's a flat urethral plate. It's narrow. So this is both of the worries that people have it's four millimeters wide and it's flat but if you incise it deeply then it's fine and that's the key so the person who started all of this watched uh he, he published that initial paper about okay. flat and narrow and he watched us in a webinar and sent us an email and said well, you're right. I thought I was cutting it as deep as you did until I saw you do it. And now I realize that's the reason my results are different than your results. So all of this came from that paper. And he admits that it was a technical factor and not an anatomic factor. So one lesson that we want you to walk away from this is this. The complications that you see when you're in clinic from hypospadia surgery are almost always due to mistakes that a surgeon made, not other factors that you can think of. So that's kind of depressing, except that it also means we that we can, can do better. better. And that's what our database is for. And all of the things that we are teaching you really come from that because we know that when we've had problems in an area, if we've made a technical change to it, then that complication rate improves. And that's exactly what we want to do as surgeons. So now we'll move on to more than 30 degree curvature. We're going to start again about, well, what have we all been taught? 
And so in my time, we were taught that a good operation for this is the transverse on the ducket tube perpucial um, flap. And John published that it had 85% success. One step repair for proximal hype space, 85% success. But now his successors have come along and admitted that actually that was 85% failures. The same thing with Byers flap that was published a number of years ago, it was a very low complication rate with excellent results. And now the same institution and others have admitted that in fact, there's a much higher complication rate as you see here. And so the other thing is when we talk about two-stage buyer's flaps, well, how many operations do you really end up doing in those? And you see that most places have most of those patients having more than two operations. So that's important and you'll see why we're bringing that point up in a moment. So for what we do, we do a straighten and graft procedure, a stag repair. So once we've confirmed that that curvature is there after degloving, we're gonna cut the urethral plate way up near the corona, dissect it all the way down to the sphincter because we're gonna gain length when we lengthen the ventral corpora and we want that native urinary channel to reach as far out as we can to shorten the distance of our graft. Once we do that, we'll do the three corporotomies. And you really want to get that urethra out of the way because it varies based on the anatomy where the penis is bent. Usually it's in the middle of the penis, but sometimes it can be way down low and sometimes it can be way up high. So you want the urinary channel out of the way so that you can really get a good assessment of that. In almost all proximal hypospadias repairs, not all, and we'll talk about that, but in most, once you've done that urinary dissection, you can then gently stretch the urethra and the urethral plate back out to cover all three of those corporotomies. And then you'll you know, use your spongiosum to cover over the corporotomies laterally to decrease your bleeding. And then we'll go ahead and harvest prep use for our graft, tack it down as you see here. But the problem is that the urethra doesn't always reach back out there. And when it doesn't, we're going to do this procedure. We're going to break stag into its components. We're going to straighten it, and then we're going to close the skin and let those corporotomies heal. Then we're going to come back and do a two-stage graft repair. So we're in a stag, we straighten and graft and then do this, the last stage to tubularize it. In this procedure, we straighten, stop, graft, stop tubularized stop. So who are the patients that you need to do this in? Well, most of your perineal scrotal hypospadiasis, their native urethra is just not going to reach past those corporotomies. The other one is a picture that you've seen before, but this is a very distal bend. And when you have a really distal bend like that, usually even if you have a long native urethra it's not going to reach past those and even if it does then you're left with such a short little graft that it, it has a difficult time healing so these are the two circumstances that we would do a stack repair in a primary so most primary proximal hypospadias doesn't need it but these two patients do so it now becomes a little complicated and just bear with us we're just showing you things which are possibly new to you. So we want to give you a suggestion on how you can go from whatever it is you're being taught to this kind of idea in a simpler fashion. So we're going to call this a simple stack repair. You're, we're not going to worry about everything that we're going to show you in a minute. We're just going to deglove the penis. We're going to just dissect the urethra and set all the way back to the sphincter. It's going to go down to the penis scrotal junction. You're comfortable with that. We'll do the corporotomies. You see that's not hard to do. And then we're just going to dissect a dartos flap from the skin on one side or the other and just lay it over it and just stitch around it to make it that it's waterproof. Like yes. Yeah, just stitch the around. And then around it. And then we're just going to close the skin. That's it. Then we're going to tack the skin here on each side with 5 PDS because now that this penis that was bent is straight, his natural erections are going to stretch the skin and help there be better skin, as we'll show you a picture in a moment. And this is a beautiful surgery to know about for any redos that you have with your system curvature. So, so here's a guy that has no ventral skin. There's no ventral penile skin, and he's got 
55 degrees of ventral curvature here. So in this case, we did the three corporotomies and we closed the skin. So this is a stack repair and this is at the end of the first operation. But if you didn't know that, you would think that's a finished repair. It's a normal looking penis already. And now that the penis is straight and those corporotomy incisions are healed, now we can just open this right down the middle and lay in our graft. And then we're done with that operation and we can come back and finally, we're going to tubularize a very healthy graft right here. And then the final stage she'll describe to you, but remember I talked about proximal tip earlier, well, it's the same thing. The exact same thing. So you're gonna make this Y-shaped incision. You wanna go way down into the scrotum because we're going to harvest tunica vaginalis in every single one of these cases. We do a big extended gland swing dissection because these usually have small glands and we wanna bring that together over the neourethra without any tension. We do a first layer, it's interrupted with 7-O-Vicryl um, for a propucial graft. It's, if we use an oral graft, we use a 6-O-Vicryl for that first layer, but the first layer is interrupted and then the second layer is running. We have a 4% fistula rate with that. If you do running first Another layer way. and then interrupted, which is much faster, the published um, fistula rate in that circumstance is 20%, big difference. Then we harvest our tunica vaginalis flap, secure that over, and then we do the exact same glansplasty that we do for a tip. So we're doing the same steps over and over and over um, because that consistency is really where you're going to find that sweet spot. So I said earlier that we see lots and lots of teens and young adults with curvature who had plication or Cordy excision when they were younger. So I'm gonna use that patient to answer this question. Is it worth doing severe hypospadias in three stages? Well, he had a two-stage primary repair, and now he's, it, he's not gonna get this fixed with doing that again. It, this is going to take a three-step repair, just like we showed you, and now he needs hyperbaric oxygen because he's gonna end up with several operations on these tissues, and it's just not gonna heal well his without it. His skin is markedly shorter, shorter on, on this side. Surface. Remember, his penis is gonna be longer. This is a big deal. And in a teenager, with all the emotional aspects of that, this is not a good place to be. I do want to point out, though, it's not just the teenagers we see. And the teenagers oh, yeah. that come in don't say, all of a sudden, I went through puberty, and my penis was straight, and it bent over. That is never the case. You can always see it prepubertally. When you ask these guys, they say it's been there as long as I can remember. It's just for some of these guys, it got kicked down the road until their penis got so big that they couldn't ignore it anymore. So again, we're making the point another time that the penis has to be straight and it has to stay straight after you do that. And the three corporatomies that we've explained to you, the data says that's the most reliable way to do it. And so you shouldn't put graphs on any of that. And then the urethroplasty graft, you shouldn't put that on those incisions. We only graft at the same time as we straighten the penis, when the graft will be beyond that. So the urethra reaches past the incisions and then we're gonna put it on intact corpora. We never put a graft onto corporotomy incisions because they don't heal as well. That's new data that we haven't really talked about much, but, but that's why. So it's, it's not us declaring what we're going to do, it's the anatomy which decides what we're going to so do. So unlike the urethral plate sort of anatomy, where it didn't matter for a distal repair, when it comes to curvature, now it does matter because it's up to the patient's penis, I guess, whether that curvature is distal or more proximal, and then their hypospadias nature as to how long their urinary channel is. So but this is what you get by taking this approach. And I, I wanna explain for one second, these are patients who have come to us with the most severe form of hypospadias. And these patients, it happens, were all told by their treating physician before they came to us that they needed to raise this child as a girl. And so we were, we were researching that. In the process of doing it, we thought, let's just go back and pull out all their pictures. So we didn't select these to show you our best stack of pictures. 
we selected these because these are among the most severe patients. So you can see pre-op and post-op. Look at this, from here to there, from here to, from, I'm sorry, from here, oh, I'm yeah. all confused now. I know. Yeah, here to there. <laughs> I should know that. Yeah, here to, uh, to here and from here to there. So look at the penis. That's a, you would never guess that this boy well, started. a girl with, for three yeah, months. Yeah, three months. Life. So that's what you get and that's the reward the patient gets from doing it in this way. So that's kind of our message about hypospadias. We can talk about hypospadias for three days and not cover everything, but we also wanna leave you with just a few thoughts specific to your station in life. So a few years ago, when we were at the university, we actually made up a survey and sent it around to the fellows at the time. And I just wanted to ask this question, how are you going to make decisions? You're, you, you're seeing different things in your training, one you know, of your professors does it one way, one does it another way, and we all have to make decisions, what are we gonna do? And then something comes in, you go, I don't think I saw that in, in fellowship. So how are you gonna make those decisions? And we ask, are, are you gonna look at articles for that? Or maybe literature reviews, or maybe look at textbook chapters to summarize all that, or just kind of rely on what your mentor taught you. And this was what we got as a response. That most people are going to do. They, they trust what their mentor told them. And then we have a second question. When you leave, if you're leaving this year or next year, when you leave, do you expect there's going to be a learning curve where your complication rates will initially be higher and then begin to come down? And the answer is yes. If you look at this study, that said it took them about five years and about 80 repairs, and then the complication rate significantly came down. Or the answer is no. You could explain that. That would that. be our study where we took five consecutive graduating fellows, so all of us in a row, and we took the same two year time period for each of us and compared our results that year to Dr. Snodgrass's results. So we'd been in practice anywhere from one to five years afterwards. And what we found was that our results were statistically the exact same as our mentors' results, meaning that if you're well-trained and you can technically do the steps in the technically correct way, you should be able to get good results from the get-go. And so that what if you read this paper, what you see is that beginning at about year three, he realized he needed to put a barrier layer. What was his outcome? Fistulas. So yes, he had a learning curve because he didn't learn that as a fellow, or if they taught him that, it didn't register with him. So the point is, it wasn't that he had to practice, 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 and then he just magically got better. He made a technical change that made him better. And our fellows, we, we looked at this specifically because I wanted to know, am I doing an effective job in teaching? And it was good to see that yes, the people when they left our program went into practice, immediately got results that were the same as my results. So you can be taught as a fellow to get good results from the beginning of your practice with distal hypospadias repair, but you have to do it right. So he wouldn't have had a learning curve if he had just done the barrier layer in the first place. So we said earlier that most complications are the results of mistakes that the surgeon makes himself. So here's a question for you. Are you being taught technical errors? And not just in hypospadias, but in everything that we do. Is it possible that somebody has taught you a tech error? Because if it is, then you're going to go out and make the same mistake. And maybe teach others to do that same mistake. So we're going to suggest that you do a little self-quality assurance as you start out your practice. Just make a little day, make an Excel spreadsheet and just put these factors into it and just record it for your hypospadias. When, when you do the procedure, when they come back for follow-up, just put that amount of information Take into a spreadsheet. Seconds. 
Yeah, no time at all. And then when you've got 25 patients or some number in it, just look and see. And what you'll see is, yeah, and, and Dr. Bush will provide you if you want something more complicated than that. Well, yeah, the template I'll yeah. provide you, but, but the complications, you really need to use standardized complications. Yeah, right. And I have a list that if you email me and our emails are at the end, I'll be happy to share with you. And how do we know this? She hinted at it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. I've been in practice for a long time, and I've made a lot of mistakes. So I put up the mistakes that our colleagues here are mistakes that I have made. And so you can look at my list, and if you're seeing some things on there that you're doing, then I'll just suggest to you that you're heading down a path that you don't want to go these down. These were all things that I learned during my fellowship, and so it stopped there, then we would still be doing surgeries that harmed little boys, and that's not our goal, of course. So this, all of this that we've talked about is in fact database, data driven. We call this the three Ps. We encourage you throughout your career to do prospective data collection. As we say, set up a spreadsheet and just put the data in it as you go. And then take some time to look at it a few times a year or however often is appropriate. And you'll see almost without doubt that your results are not as good as you thought they were. That has been the absolute defining aspect of my practice, I always find that my results are not as good as I thought, but then we've made changes, and then you can repeat this process. You change from dark toes to a tunica vaginalis flap, and then you start looking at this again, and in a period of time, you have enough patience, and you can see if it made a difference or not, or whatever complication you're having. So you could just, this keeps cycling, and for those of you who are going into academics, this is the gift that never quits giving. Our database now is 20 years old and has thousands of patients and data entry points in it. We, we just can, keep adding columns. Yeah, we can, can write a, we can write a paper about anything in no time at all. So everything that we've shown you today, we're gonna borrow, I think it's the Home Depot or the Lowe's, I don't know which one it is, motto. You can do it, we can help. Here's where we practice. This is our surgery center here, and you can reach us by these emails. You can come visit us. You can go on YouTube and see our videos. We're just about to start turning out a lot more of those updated ones, and we also have a email group to discuss these kind of issues and show cases and all that, and if you're interested in being added to that, just send one of us an email here, and we'll add you to it. I think that brings us to an end. We're supposed to share this with you um, where you can take a survey. And I think we'll have some time, some time for, for questions. questions. Let me pull them up here because you guys can send them on the question and answer setting. So. Oh, so the very first one. So, you know, there's only so many things we can show at a time. I used to do that. So the question is, you know, can you just put the graft onto these? Can you bring the urethra below the corporotomies? and then stick the graft over it. And the answer is I did that for a number of years. Those were years before I measured the grafts. And so you can really be fooled by graft appearance. When we started measuring our grafts and looking at that, what we found is when we put a graft on intact corpora, so the, the, the corporotomies are all covered by urethra, and we put the graft on intact corpora, our graft success rate is 95%, 95%, primary and redo grafts. If we put it on one or more corporotomies, that number drops down to 33% failure rate, failure rate. And so you can say- Meaning the graft shrinks more than 50%. 50%. So not just a little shrinkage, but a lot, a lot of, of shrinkage to the effect that you have to either partially or completely regraft. Yes, you have to fix the graft or you have to regraft. And so that still sounds, and that's why I didn't notice it for years when I wasn't measuring and being really objective about it, because many of them did fine. The problem is that when they don't do well and they contract, they also damage the skin next to it. And some of the worst problems that we've dealt with were based upon 
inadequate ventral skin. When you lose graft and you lose those flaps of skin that you brought around, it's really, really hard to get out of the ditch and make a normal looking penis. So even though, you know, two out of three that you place a graft onto the corporotomies will probably do okay, that one out of three is catastrophic potentially to getting to a normal penis. And so, you know, it's just like with reconstructive surgery, like for breasts, when somebody has cancer, you don't usually see those plastic surgeons coming in and doing everything all at once, the, the flaps and the prosthesis and the nipple and all that it's too much for the body to handle they do one bit and then come back and then touch that up and then come back and then make the nipple and that really is kind of where we're headed most kids with proximal hypospadias you're going to be able to cover all three of those corporatomies if you do the moves that we that we showed you but if they have a really distal bend that's a bad spot to have skin loss. I mean, really bad. And so this is a better way to go for the majority of patients. Let me say this in one more way. All of you know that the outcomes for proximal hypospadias that are published in our literature are terrible. They're terrible. Over half the boys, really closer up to 60 to 80 percent, even up to 100 percent, have complications and some of those have multiple complications so we don't want to do operations that run the risk of high complications if we do if we do the worst repair we do worst meaning three steps so with three-step repair the and the most severe patients and the most severe patients we've already told you that perineal hypospadias with no skin so we take those boys right there and we just do straight and close that has 98 percent success then we put a graft in that has 95 percent success. Now it's on a smooth surface, and even though it's a long graft, it's smooth and it heals, heals. well. And then our third operation has 85 percent success. So match those numbers with whatever you're doing, and then we can have a discussion about what's best. But the fact is that most of these boys, remember, I said that buyers flaps. Most centers that are doing it most of those patients have more than two operations and yet when they're done many of you are being taught not to even correct it all the way out to the tip but bring it to the corona so again we just yeah so we're just going to put all of this together and say the goal is to make a normal penis we would like to do that in as few operations as possible but it's not the number of operations it's the end result that counts and we believe that every operation you do should be an operation that has the highest success rate. So what about this next one? Yes, we have overlapping suture lines. Yep. But then we have the tunica vaginalis on top of that under the, you know, so that the skin isn't right on top of those. But we don't have any qualms about having one layer for the erythroplasty and then another layer. And then another thing that we've added to our algorithm is we just stick a little angiocath in there and the meatus and pressurize it. And then you get instant feedback if there's an area where a fistula might be ready to happen. So we have a few more questions. We'll answer these rather quickly. The youngest patient we repair with well, most of our patients, our practice is all hypospadias and two thirds of it is severe hypospadias. And so we, you know, we don't ever do that before six months because we want their natural post postnatal testosterone surge to have its effect. So many of those are preemies. But we've, but we did when we do distal repairs, we have done those and published doing those at less than six months. So three months we can do a distal repair. It's just our practice doesn't have many of those anymore. And then somebody wants to know about testosterone. Maybe I'll answer that quick and then you answer this about grass. So testosterone, here is our brief experience with that. First off, I'll start out by saying that many of you are being taught to use testosterone in boys with a small appearing penis, but you're not gonna find an article that shows that that treatment in proximal hypospadias improves outcomes. That's not been published. So we looked at it because of glands dehiscence. We had more glands dehiscence in proximal tip than we did in distal tip. Same surgeon did it, same technique, difference in results. 
So we looked at that. This was when you were a fellow, I think, and then a young faculty so member. I hypothesized that there was a difference in the size. Grand we, so size. we started measuring lots of penises, and sure enough, found proximal glands penis was smaller than distal hypostadius. And so we published that. And when she showed me that data, I thought, okay, this is easy because we can give testosterone, grow the glands bigger, and then we should take care of our glands dehiscent. So that's where our background was. So we did that. We were very methodical. We said, if your glands is less than 14 millimeters, you get testosterone. But not only do you get it, but you get it and then we measure you again and we keep giving testosterone in ever increasing doses until your glands is 14 millimeters or greater. At the same time, we had other boys with the same extent of proximal hypospadias where the glands was already 14 millimeters or larger. So there's our control group. So we took those two groups of patients now, at the time of surgery, they are the same, same size. We should mention that when we started measuring, we actually gave twice as much testosterone. So our eyes missed about half of the small glands that now we picked up by measuring. And we also published that the standard dose, the two milligrams per kilogram, doesn't work for most of these kids. They have some degree of androgen resistance and it doesn't grow them, the proximal. The distals, it will grow, grow just fine, but the proximal often need higher so we did all that, but here's the bottom line. We looked at the outcomes and the complication rate, the glands dehiscence and other complications in the boys that got testosterone remained 30% higher, even though they should have been the same. If, if the size was the most important factor. And so that told us, well, we can give testosterone, but the reason to give it was to decrease complications and it didn't work. Around that same time, I happened to make a trip to Japan to watch something they were doing, and they dissected the glands wings much more extensively than I was taught to do. And so we incorporated that into our practice. We didn't know what to do when we found yeah. the testosterone increased the complication rates. And so we were really lucky that he took this trip to yeah, Japan. Yeah, right at then. just the right moment. And so we yeah. came back and did that. Yeah, so now our, our glands dehiscence rate has moved down significantly. We accomplished what we thought we would with testosterone and didn't by changing our technique. So once again, we were making a technical error that I was taught in my training and didn't know was a technical error until we had that experience. So now somebody wants to know about how, how do we choose grafts? What's our favorite graft? Our favorite graft is by far and away prep use. So we really didn't go into these details, but now in a stack repair, we actually start with foreskin reconstruction. So we hardly ever deglove a penis anymore circumferentially. We deglove it all along the ventral surface so that we can save that foreskin. And so if we have a patient that the urethra reaches past those corporotomy sites, then at that point in the surgery, we'll harvest the prep use and use that as our graft. If it doesn't reach past the corporotomy sites, then we'll put the dartos flap over the corporotomy sites, close the skin and actually reconstruct the foreskin all the way up past the glands so that the next time we do essentially a circumcision and all of that foreskin can go all the way down to the penis scrotal junction or even lower. So prep use is always our first choice because it's thinner. Thinner. Unless a family really strongly desires foreskin reconstruction. And one other thing that's important about foreskin that she's gonna say about oral graft, the penis knows that that's penis skin some way because when you take that graft off and sew it on the underside, where it's sewn to the shaft skin on either side, there's very little reaction very little scarring there, and the graft doesn't get thicker. But that's not true when you take oral graft. So for oral graft, then you have to go to lip. You never, ever, 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 we can't tell you enough, want to put cheek in the glands of the prepubertal patient. It's going to dehisce. We published that many years ago. So if you see that, it's a technical error. Um, if we need a short graft, you know, like to the mid shaft, we'll use upper lip. If we need something long all the way um, through the penis, we'll use lower lip. We would only use cheek graft if we are kind of out of sights or if we have a, you know, back when we were putting them over corporotomies and you had part of the graft that contracted, the part of the glands was okay, but the part of the corporotomy contracted, you could put a cheek graft in that setting. Yeah, that's a lot to digest there. But the fact is, we almost, 
We, yeah, we almost never use cheek, and, and it should not be what you go to. Behind the ear is great if you need skin replacement. So it's um, a little hard sometimes for a complete replacement graft. You could use it. It's we have used enough. it, but it's not quite wide enough, and it doesn't stretch like prep use does, and the lower lip will give you a wider graft. So we haven't really used it in most settings. If you have a really tiny, narrow penis, yeah, for the urethra. If you're going to use posterior auricular for a urethra that's proximal, you really have to often take both and then sew them it's together. Yeah, and we just don't want to that do that. So, but we have, we think this is great when you have a, a skin, penile skin deficiency. This is better than using groin or other things. We've become it's increasingly, hairless. yeah, it's hairless and it leaves and it, a really nice scar. scar. So yes, there are differences. We just said, do we wait six months or more? Yes. Yes, but but not more in the sense of some people say that you need to wait a year or longer. We don't know of any data that's that supports that. If you've got a graft contracture, it's not going to get better if you wait for ten years. So so we don't. We wait for six months. We don't do it before then, but any time from six months on, we don't we don't believe that grafts get better with time. We certainly had patients that for various reasons didn't get done at six months, and it's not like they came in at a year and we went, oh wow, that's the best graft we've ever seen. So we don't think that waiting longer is beneficial to the patient. Any experience with SIS, um, yes, and it was bad. So. Well, I was told by a visiting professor, oh, this is great. You don't need to do tunica vaginalis. You could just put that over your neo-urethra. And I did that on three patients, and all of them got multiple fistulas like a flute. If for using it on the corpora, why don't we do that? Well, I think we answered that. There's two reasons. One is that some of those are going to contract, and a few of them have been I have ballooned and that's been published. But the main reason we don't use SIS is because we don't do a single corporotomy and then graft the corporal incision because then you have to do some sort of flap repair and we're not gonna do that. You could say, well, wait, why don't you do your three-step stack repair? You could straighten with a single incision, do your SIS graft, close the skin then come back in six months and do a two-stage graft repair. The problem then, why would we not do that? You're gonna have some graft contractures. And you're gonna have some that are, that we published that in boys with proximal hypospadias, using a goniometer, doing objective measurements, that the average degree of curvature is 70 degrees, and it ranges from 30 to 120. So it's skewed to that higher end, and, and 70 degrees, 80, 90, 120, you are not gonna get the penis straight with a single incision. So we just don't do that. All right, and finally, when we check the erection after ventral curvature correction, do you prefer using the vessel loop or direct catheter saline infusion? So we check lots of erections before we make those three corporotomies. We don't really check erections after you make the corporotomies. We used to, um, you, you know, you can switch from a 23 gauge to an eight uh, to a 21, 21 gauge butterfly, and in the small penis for a really severe proximal, you can probably get it. But but most of the time, you don't really need to check it. The three incisions will reliably straighten it because now you've you've just you know you've got three different spots for it to stretch out. And so you don't have to be as exact as you would with a single corporotomy and placing a graft. So we don't do that. We have a whole nother discussion just about how do you know that your three incisions worked? We just don't have time to share that with you right now. But the bottom line is that do we, when we're checking an erection for the first time, before we've done, but this is as after, let's change that to before we do it. We do the first injection without a vessel loop. And we have seen patients who came to us with recurrent curvature that the original surgeon missed because he put a tourniquet on and then did the erection. And sure enough, the bending was down there. She right said, at the penis structure, junction. Junction. you can't see it. 
Oh, I'm sorry. She said earlier, most bending is in the middle of the penis. Some bending is distal and some is proximal. And one of the U.S. News and World Report top programs in the country, the chairman of that did a boy, straightened him, and he kept getting recurrent fistulas at the penis scrotal junction. And we found that he was bent right there. And I know that it was missed because they put a tourniquet on and didn't do the first injection without a tourniquet. So we always do the first one without it. And then once we you know it is- You also need to really split that scrotum open so that you can see all the way down. That's how you're gonna measure with your goniometer and you need to be sure you look down there. So we thank you for you know, signing up and watching. And again, if you have additional questions or rebuttals or whatever, we invite you to contact us. We'll also say that particularly when things calm down in the world, any of you are welcome to come visit us. We operate four days a week. We do three cases a day. If you come for one week, you'll see all of these that we're talking about. And we're happy to have you come and, and share that with you. So now the directors want you to answer the uh, to go to that side and take a survey so again thank you for your attention thank you for joining us okay. good night